John. Men. We've been talking a lot over the last couple of years about the changing geopolitical situation. We've been talking about how the whole world and the financial world in particular is at an inflection point and everything's going to change. And when we've been talking about it, one of the things that I'm afraid was not on our list was uh, a new Israel-Hamas conflict. Um, But this does have massive impacts on the area that we talk about on economics and on finance, and in particular, possibly on um, the way that inflation will move over the next couple of years, right? Yeah, I mean, it's all just more evidence of a deteriorating overall kind of like geopolitical kind of sphere um, and more disruption to what uh, what the world that we kind of grew up in, if you like, looked like and what it no longer looks like and that what everyone's having to get used to it being. And the new environment, you know, to make it, you know, uh, cut a very long story short, is just that, you know, it's going to be more inflationary and more volatile and uh, more disrupted and more kind of nasty surprises, um, which is not very cheerful, but um, that is the way that it is. It is. And one of the things that I've been thinking about, because you know I think about this a lot, is um, ESG investing and the way that environmental, social and government factors taken into account when, when you invest. And we talked after the um, war in the Ukraine began, we talked about how defence, which had long been considered something that you absolutely could not invest in because it was you know, obviously bad because uh, owning shares in a company that creates things that kill people is, is clearly horrible. And then after that war started, everyone started to look at it again and say, well, actually, you know, defense is really a social good. Uh, Having an adequate defense in place for your population is surely the very definition of a social good, assuming you believe in democracy, freedom, etc. Of of course, which clearly not everybody does. So we got to the point where we're like, well, in in wartime, maybe defense is about as ESG as, as you can get. And now everything is shifting as well in terms of energy and fuels, etc. And I got a note the other day from a fund manager explaining how investing in mining is now a good thing. And for years, of course, you and I have been told that you can't touch a mine with a barge pole because it's really dirty and all the diesel, big machines and the ecosystem destruction that's basically built into to mining and, of course, the use of water. All these things make uh, mining non-ESG. And now, of course, as energy security flies to the top of, of everyone's to-do list, mining is, is very ESG. What could be more a social good than mining for the metals that allow the energy transition to happen to the extent that it can happen? So ESG is kind of, it's, it's disappearing. It's disappearing into reality. Yeah, it's, uh, yes, events have kind of overtaken it. It's... Uh... I mean, the frustrating thing is this has been blindingly obvious from the start, you know, when all of these idiots were talking about stranded assets and all of that sort of stuff. And you were like, well, OK, maybe they'll be stranded one day. But first of all, when you get to the point where we don't need this stuff anymore, um, you know, and it's, it's somewhat frustrating that we can end up in uh, at the point where it's only once, you know, like push comes to shove that kind of logic starts to kick in again um i you know we we wasted an awful lot of time um and an awful lot of paperwork um because esg was a useful way basically for you know one group of people to virtue signal and for another kind of like group of people in the financial industry to find a sales pitch for john it's been it's been the most exciting, if you're a marketing man in fund management, most exciting mar- marketing campaign since the beginning of fund management. You know, the amount of money that is poured into this nonsense, because uh, a lot of it is nonsense, let's be clear at this point, a lot of it is complete nonsense, that is poured into this nonsense since, what, 2014, 2015 when it kicked off. This has been a marketing man's dream, but it's also been deeply misguided. Yeah, um, like a huge waste of time. Um, and, and investment capital in a lot of cases. Um, so it's, it's it's good that uh, we're coming out of this, um, but it's uh, you know I mean, it, it'll kind of pop up in other ways. You know, so it's like so it's rebranded so that it's now it's ESG. It's ES, It's okay. It's good. It's it's good to mine as long as you're mining for lithium. 
you know, that there, there is that as well. You know, it's kind of, you know, nobody's kind of saying that, oh, yeah, it's good to mine for coal yet. Yeah. You know, um, uh, I think we're, we're very nearly there because let's not forget that you need coal to make steel and you need steel to put up a wind turbine. Not yeah. all coal is not all steel is is, is from coal, but uh, you need coal to make the majority of steel around the world. So I don't think it's very long before I get a note from a fund manager saying mining coal for good, feel good with coal. <laughs> yes, yes. You can't be too cynical about this stuff. No, that's that's you, one you, thing I've learned. Absolutely right. You can't be too cynical. In fact, I was talking to someone about it the other day, and I was thinking once once you take this pragmatic approach to ESG, there's no limit. No mm. limit of where it can end. You know, take tobacco companies, right? Amazingly well run, survived longer, chucked out more cash than anyone could could possibly have begun to imagine when when the consequences of smoking became clear. So there's a lot of pensions and there's done really well out of that. Is that a social good? And we were told, weren't we, by um, by Paul Johnson the other day, that the cash that they pour into our treasuries far outweighs the medical cost of dealing with, with smokers and finances. So many other things that the state do. Wow, what a social good. You see, once you get going... <laughs> Once you get going, there, there's no end. It all means nothing. I mean, you're basically saying uh, buy cigarettes to save our NHS. Yes. <laughs> yes, that is, that is what I said. But I... <laughs> Listen, Clark for I the tobacco I... companies. That's all right, uh... stop. Just stop. <laughs> Just stop. Right. Okay, moving on. Personal finance tip of the week. Give me one, John. Uh, yeah, well... <laughs> Um, interest rates, interest rates, although the long term outlook for inflation is obviously volatile and uh, up and down, um, at the moment it looks as if the Bank of England is probably, I, I think that the Bank of England's done at five and a quarter percent. Now, obviously it might go a little bit further, but looking at the latest uh, wage data, and obviously we're, we're recording this uh, early, so we haven't had um, the, the inflation data for September yet. But chances are that it's going to, that you can see that the bank is itching to kind of like call an end to rate hikes now. Um, and so we've seen NSNI, the government uh, bond kind of like retail facing bit, uh, remove its 6.2% interest rate. Um, it's a shame. Savings I account. did not get round to, I did not get round to that. No, I didn't. Damn, I'm and so this bad is at why. Admin. I'm thinking today is when we should be telling people, look, okay, so maybe if you've not been getting round to stuff, you should start looking for your, your one year fixed rate accounts now. If you've got a bit of cash, um, then, you know, it's probably time to have a look because you can still get, if it's for a, for a tax paying account, you can still get a one year at 6.1%, which is half decent. Um, I think that's going through raising, uh, you know, they kind of, that's the, the place that does the uh, it, it puts your money into the best savings account that it can find, um, or you can go for a fixed cash ISA. Paragon does one for five point five five percent. I'm just looking at Money Facts five point five percent with Aldermore, Mansfield Building Society five point four with Leeds and Yorkshire. So there's still you know you can get a half decent rate and. Given that inflation is probably going to come down to below five percent in the final quarter of this year, it's at least going to be getting a kind of real return. So it's look, it's amazing, not the isn't worst. it, these days, John? That the best we think we can hope for is to get a rate of interest that is only slightly below the rate of inflation. I don't know. This is slightly higher. Okay. It will be. It will be. It will be. It will be. So there's there's John predicting inflation for you as well. Wow. <laughs> Dangerous territory. Nothing, nothing only, you can't get on Only this come podcast. December. <laughs> All right. Now, um, uh, listen, I, I do want to make clear before we before we go on to our interview today that we did record this interview a little while ago. So it was recorded before the Israel Hamas conflict began. And that is why it doesn't mention it. Not because um, not because we didn't mention it. It just hadn't hadn't begun by then. So it was recorded a little early. And uh, this conversation that John and I are having, it's also being recorded a few days before the podcast comes out. So obviously things uh, are fast moving and may have changed by the time it does come out. Welcome to Marin Talks Money, the podcast in which people who know the markets explain the markets. I'm Marin Zumset Webb. This week, we bring you a conversation with Douglas Abbott, head of UK wealth at Schroders, and Duncan Lamont, global head of pensions and investments, also at Schroders. Duncan, Doug, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Great to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks very much. 
Yeah, we've been waiting, Duncan, to have you on for ages. John and I mention you all the time, like a sort of mini data celebrity, and we talk about you afterwards. When will we get him to come on? When will he come on? And finally, you're here. So I hope you're really, really good, because you're really disappointing if you're not. I, 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 will, I will do my best. There's, there's a lot to live up to there. I know. Right. What I want to, want to start by talking about, Duncan, is you've done quite a lot of work into the shrinking pool of equities in the UK, the where we are gradually de-equitizing and the extent to which that matters. So I wonder if we can start by talking about what's actually happening. Where is the UK equity market going? Yeah, so I think that there is an increased awareness about this, but I'm, I don't think people have quite got their head around the scale of what has been happening, um, both in the UK, but also internationally. And maybe we can come on to the, the international element too. Just, just to give you some numbers, um, back in 1996, there was 2,700 companies on the main market of the London Stock Exchange. Now there is 1,077. That's a 60% reduction. If we look even longer time horizon, so since the 1960s, there's actually been a 75% reduction in the number of UK companies. Um, add in AIM, hey, for AIM for a few years actually was attracting loads of companies. Um, and actually, that kind of makes it look a bit better, but the number of AIM companies has also fallen by half now. Um, so there really is a situation where companies have been rejecting um, a UK stock market listing, both from the, and there's two sides here. One is less appetite for an IPO, but the other side is also a kind of sustained drip, drip, drip of um, delistings, which is mainly from mergers and acquisitions. Yeah. And we've seen quite a lot of that this year already, haven't we? We've seen quite a lot of uh, transactions that have taken companies off the market and pretty much no IPOs, but one, one IPO. Yeah, like if, if the, the delisting situation is interesting because it's been happening everywhere around the world. So I did some work looking at the number of companies that were listed on uh, the UK stock market in 2011 and then what had happened over the following decade, like how many were still listed, what happened, where, what direction they'd gone in. And about a third of them had delisted over that period. Um, and the overwhelming majority, almost all of them, it was because they'd been bought. Um, not many companies just decide, hey, I've had enough, I'm kind of throwing the towel in and leave the stock market. Most of it's because they're being bought. And this this kind of so far so global is the same in the US, it's the same in Europe, lots of delistings, lots of M&A. But the big difference in the UK, actually, is that who have been the buyers of those companies. In the US, the biggest buyers of um, uh, US public companies in the delisting trend have been other US public companies. So if you keep investing in the U.S. stock market, you still kind of have exposure to those those businesses that have gone, just not on a standalone business. They're kind of subsumed in another company. In the U.K., the majority of the people doing the buying have been overseas buyers, um, mainly U.S. and Canadian ones. So what we have had is the U.K. PLC has been kind of seeping overseas into largely American and buyers and private equity buyers. So U.K. investors no longer have the same access to those companies if they're investing in the U.K. stock market. And that is quite a difference compared to what we see in other markets. Duncan, do you have a sense of why that is and why are our companies going abroad? Is it because they're, they're so cheap? Because UK market has been cheap for quite a long time. And so it's, a, it's, a, it's an easy thing to do to, to create growth for foreign companies just to snap up a cheap UK company and subsume it into your business. Pretty much, yeah. Um, the, 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 we've spoken about this. I know you've spoken about this on many occasions that UK companies are trading at a valuation discount to, to those around the world. Um, if I look at kind of forward price earnings multiples. The UK stock market is trading at about almost a 50% discount to the US, 20% um, discount to Europe. Um, it's not just about sectors. It's not just because we don't have the tech companies the US has. Every single, Pretty much every single sector of the UK stock market trades at a pretty chunky discount to, to the US. Um, energy sector, 40% discount. Pharma, biotech sector, uh, 29 um, is about a 40% discount as well. Across all of the, whole, the sectors, it's about 30% discount. So wherever you are looking, um, we have very kind of, I would say very successful world leading businesses that are very Kind of performing very well operationally, but are not necessarily being valued to the in the same way they would be if they were listed in another another country. And what do you put that down to? 
what I mean, I know what, what most people say this, oh, the UK is, is a wreck, you know, we don't grow, we've got horrible inflation, we destroyed ourselves with Brexit, etc. But looking at the numbers coming through more recently, none of that is really, really true. Our GDP, uh, our growth is no different to most other European countries. Our inflation levels are converging with other European countries. There's really nothing worse going on in the UK than anywhere else that you can really put your finger on, nothing you can back up with data. So what is the problem here? Um, so, so the, de- the, the valuation discount, we've always, it, it did start emerging kind of post 2016. So there has been, I think there has been an element of international investors in particular um, being less keen on the UK. And it, it, I, I kind of feel like there's maybe a bit of a situation that we've had with value investing in the same way that people have been saying it's cheap for a while. And then there were perhaps some investors who, back that view for a while, but the longer that valuation discount persists, the people's patience runs out. Um, so I, I think there's a bit of that been going on. But like, to give a little bit more of a positive side, so the M&A side means that other buyers, both private equity and overseas companies are seeing these companies are worth more than they are. The other people who recently have actually started getting very interested in buying UK shares is companies themselves. So share buybacks in the UK, um, about 45% of companies listed on the UK market last year bought back um, more than 1% of their shares in the previous year. Um, in earlier years, that figure was something like, oh, I'm just looking at a chart right now, um, we might be talking at about 20%. So it's absolutely rocketed. So directors of UK PLC have said, we think our shares are undervalued and we're going to start buying them back. And that's not just the investment trust sector, just to be clear, because there's a lot of buybacks in the investment trust sector, which could be skewing the numbers. No, that's not just the investment trust sector at all. We're seeing there's been very large increases in buybacks across the UK corporate sector in general. So, and, and this is, in previous years, it was mainly the US where lots of the buybacks happened. But what we've seen more recently is that it's been picking up in a lot of non-US markets. Japan as well is a market where we've seen buybacks. But I think there, I think there is an element here of, um, directors saying, well, actually, we think our shares are not necessarily fully valued. And people criticize buybacks for the timing of them sometimes. But hey, if your shares are undervalued, then that's actually the ideal time to be doing some buybacks. Um, that can be quite um, a value generator in time. Yeah, one of the long-term criticisms of buybacks is that you quite often see them at levels that are definitely not cheap. And there's a, a relationship between uh, top management long-term bonuses and uh, the buyback. So that's been a long-term criticism, but you couldn't say that that was the case in the UK given the valuations. Um, but actually, to, to, to put a bit of um, an international perspective on this as well, so some of this has been maybe a bit downbeat on the UK and saying, and, and like we, self-flagellation, I do feel like is a, Brit, like a British pastime, like woe is us, look how awful we are compared with everyone on the world stage. And actually, this trend of de-equitization of companies not wanting to join the stock market, of companies leaving the stock market, it's global. It, it, there's, 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 nothing, there's nothing that's making us special and saying that we're having an awful situation and everybody else is, is perfectly happy. Like the number of German companies is down 40% since 2007. Like we, everyone said, puts the US on a pedestal and says how great, it, how great it is. And it is having an increased share of, kind of IPOs and of companies wanting to list there. But the number of U.S. companies is down 40% since the mid-90s. This, this isn't just a U.K. feature. This is something that's happening globally. And I think, um, and we'll come on to this, a big part of this is the growth of the private equity industry. Yeah. Before we come on to that, I want to ask you possibly the most important question, which is this. Why does it matter? Why, I mean, these are huge numbers. It's obviously a big shift. But... People will be saying the companies continue to exist just in different ownership, abroad, at homes, it merged into other companies, whatever. Why does it matter if there are fewer listed companies all, all, all in? If you are a company, it is very easy for you to raise capital wherever you want in the world now. Like we've seen, obviously, lots of UK companies raising money in the US. So if the UK stock market ceased to exist, it wouldn't necessarily stop some of these large companies from being able to raise capital. If you're an investor, you can allocate money to funds, to ETFs, to individual companies anywhere in the world for relatively low cost these days. That wasn't the case in the past. So actually, I don't think that it matters that much for individuals. I don't think it matters that much to companies. Um, where it matters much more is probably actually for the UK economy. Um, the amount of 
kind of services, the industries that actually the financial services sector supports here, um, if we were to lose our standing on the world stage as a stock market, that's what would lose out. And, and probably actually, I was being a bit simplifying and saying it doesn't matter to companies. It doesn't matter if you are a big international company with a household brand. You can raise money anywhere. It matters a hell of a lot more for your small and mid-cap companies. Um, you, like, you go and list in America, they've never heard of you. That's going to be a much harder situation. So I think it matters for the ecosystem of small and mid-sized companies that um, we want to grow in the UK. I think it matters to the economy. I actually think it probably doesn't matter as much to investors as perhaps we sometimes um, claim it does. Possibly, even though uh, I know we work together, might disagree on one aspect. I think the decline of the listed market probably is a problem for the average punter who has their savings or retirement focused on the listed markets or public securities. So if companies are coming to the market much later in their development, and I guess that kind of hyper growth stage that you see in companies is being funded by private capital, that means that kind of the bulk of the population you have are relying on the public markets to kind of help them generate a pot in retirement or generate, you know, turn their savings into returns, isn't getting access to that growth opportunity. And I think we always look at the the history of the equity market and returns from equities and so on as a as a factor as as to why you should invest them in the long run. But if the equity market looks quite different, either there's less interesting companies in it, or the companies that are on the market are later stage and where they are in their cycle, that could be a problem for people in the long run as they're sort of trying to beat inflation or save in the long run. So I think there's there's something about that. And actually, while I've been quietly listening in the background, I think one bit we've missed on UK equities so far in this discussion is actually that structurally, we're seeing less domestic investment in the UK equity market um, from either retirement schemes. So we've had DB switching to more fixed income allocations. We see, we're seeing a shift from DB to DC schemes in terms of people who get advice. We're seeing a shift towards passive and global Um and those two things are related, right? So those solutions that people are being put into don't include asset classes like private equity, infrastructure, um, and real estate en masse. I think wealth managers probably are offering solutions that do that because of the investment, the listed investment trust market and the strength of that over the last 10 years in the UK. But then also people are going more global and, and that's affecting the UK equity market, which kind of comes back to Duncan's point about having a throbbing economy. So I think there's quite a lot going on here. But the decline of the equity market, I think, is um, it does have an impact if you think about where are people's long term savings being invested and have they got exposure to the exciting, innovative, growthy asset. Yeah, it also seems important to me on a, on a on a social level. You know, quoted companies we can watch them; they have a certain level of scrutiny, both for, from individuals and from the state, financially, operationally, and you know, we can see what they're doing. It's much more transparent than companies that are private, and, and we lose that. As companies leave the equity equity market, we lose that that sense that we can effectively see the UK economy via listed companies. That matters too. Yeah, I hundred percent agree with that. Um, transparency is a double edged sword. Companies might not like it, but it's a great way to be able to hold management practices to account. Um, it's harder when that's in in kind of in the private markets. Um, albeit then, I suppose you can argue that the choice of who you invest with if you want to allocate to private markets and then the types of investor they are and whether they care about particular things that align with your own beliefs, that starts to matter more, but you don't have the same look through to the companies at an investor. The flip side probably is private equity investors get much, much more information than, than public market investors. They can get access to, I don't know, regular cash flow projections, lots and lots of really in-depth data that can help with their decision making. But it is more closely held between, say, the company, the private equity investor. It's not as visible and transparent for the kind of broader social goods that you were talking about. Yeah, and it, and it means that for the individual investor, a middleman is required. And one of the things that we, we really like to get rid of in the main are, are middlemen, or certainly the necessity for middlemen. But if you're going to invest in unlisted companies as an individual investor, you really have no choice but to do it via a professional. And that makes a difference too. Yeah, so, so actually, so actually Doug, I completely agree with what Doug was saying. Actually, my points around um, it not mattering as much to investors were much more about the, say, the demise of the UK stock market relative to the global market still existing. I completely agree on the the, the risks that might come from the um, the public market being less relevant. If you take it to the extreme, it potentially fuels inequality. 
um, because those who have assets can access all of these exciting, sexy companies. Um, your ordinary retail investor is basically cut out of that. They're too small. The fees are too high. They can't. They basically don't get a seat at that table. So all the kind of haves, which is everybody with tons of assets, and here I actually include defined benefit pension funds. Um, they get to access all the great areas. Your um, the have nots, and in that I'm going to include defined contribution investors on the whole, not not all of them, but um, it's a lot harder for them historically to have been able to access some of these private assets. Yeah, so the the growth the growth goes where the money are already is. Okay, well, there's not much we can do, uh, the three of us, on this podcast in 30 minutes about the uh, decline of the number of listed companies uh, globally. We have to take what we have for now. So let's talk a little bit about how the private markets work and how investors can or should be accessing the non-listed markets. Doug, is that really your area? Yeah, so I mean, I think it's um, it's interesting and it's difficult, right? So I think we've, uh, there's a lot of interesting companies and there's a lot of interesting assets you can get access to. But you know, the private markets are, I think they're, I think Duncan, you might have some stats on this, but there's something like seventy five percent of economic activity sits in the private markets world. But getting access to that uh, is very difficult because they are assets which are complicated. They're assets which are privately held. They're assets that don't trade regularly. Um, and the liquidity angle is the piece which a lot of people focus on. But actually, in many ways, the Ill- liquidity of these asset classes, because they have to trade between kind of willing buyers and willing sellers, and it's quite complicated, is where you often get the premium and the long term thinking that supports kind of these assets. So it, it's difficult. Um, in the UK, we have this uh, remarkable market that has been booming until sort of about 18 months to two years ago, uh, which is the listed investment trust market that actually tackles. Uh, that issue really well. Um, you know, there there you have listed companies where you have a selection of you know good average and bad managers who are doing different things around asset managers. There's been some incredible success stories um, in that area and a, a huge amount of growth in terms of raising money and getting it into markets where anyone can buy a share and they can sell a share that gives them access to private assets on a daily basis. Of course, the difficulty of investment trusts is um, when there's lots of demand, they trade really well. And when there isn't as much demand or things change, the share price can can drop quite dramatically versus the the price of the asset that you might have exposure to. So we've seen a, a big decline in discounts um, in that particular area of the investment trust market. So there is a really good vehicle there, but there, there's a whole bunch of new structures that are emerging and there's a lot of support from the Treasury to try and give different types of access to yeah. private assets. But let's let's um, just stick with the investment trust for, for a minute. There's a, there are an awful lot of private equity investment trusts in the UK, look, most of which are now trading at substantial discounts to the stated NAV. But the, the reason for that is because no one's convinced that the stated NAV is the correct, sorry, NAV being net asset value. No one's convinced that the net asset value is correct, given the sharp rise in interest rates, suggesting that a lot of these private assets should be revalued down very substantially. That's what's going on here, right? Yeah, that's definitely a feature, uh, Mary. And there's also a, you know, there's an element of how do you work that out? What does the share price accurately reflect what the NAV is? And and that is quite difficult. You know, that requires research, that requires understanding what's going on. You know, that um, that is not straightforward. But, but it, also, it about- also involves private equity managers confronting the reality of the new macroeconomic situation, which they've been slow to do. That's right. And when you have um, a complete change in the regime around inflation and interest rates, that kind of completely changes the cost of capital on which you price everything. Um, and that needs to filter through the system. And I think, you know, one of the aspects of private assets versus public equities is that, you know, that takes time, that lag factor of where the pricing was and where it should be uh, does take a bit of time. And, and we're still working through of. that. Yeah. And the question is, how far have discounts actually reflected where the pricing should be? How far are they actually gone too far? And so on. And I guess that's the difficulty for the private investor is that discount versus nav piece is quite difficult um, to navigate unless you kind of do your research and you're an expert. But what's the answer, area. Doug? What's the answer? You're the expert. I think the the reality is, is that there is no straightforward answer. I think what you have to recognise is that if you want exposure to liquid assets, it isn't as simple as owning a listed public company or a, a fund that trades daily or, and so on. This is a fact of life within the area. There's always going to be risks and so on. But what is in- interesting is I think an awful lot of people own property in the UK. Obviously, um, a, a large number of people want to own more property, particularly young people. 
But I think actually, if you think about private assets in the way that we think about real estate, most of us own a house. Most of us know that mortgage rates have gone up quite a bit. Most of us understand that probably things are coming off the boil a bit in terms of where real estate is. And that there's a dynamic there around what you think the house might be worth and what you might be bid for in terms of um, having an offer on a house. And that's how private assets work. And actually, if you think of it in that way and realize when you're going into an asset class, when you're buying a share in one of these companies, that there may be a risk that things are overvalued and things might come down. Or that if you're buying a share and the NAVs, um, the, the NAVs are where they are and there's a big discount and the NAVs may come down a bit. If you think about it in that way, you know, you can get your head around it, but you do need to kind of, people do need to recognize that, you know, this is an area where it's not straightforward and you need to think about more things that are going on and also recognize that not everyone's perfect in this area, right? Some people are good, some people are average, some people are not so good in terms of what they're managing. And there isn't a catch-all for private assets. You know, when we think about the equity market, we talk about sectors, we talk about themes, we talk about mid caps, we talk about small caps, we talk about emerging, developed, and so on. Well, that's exactly the same in private markets. You can't sort of tar, let's call private equity. Um, you can't say that is all kind of uniform. You really have to do your homework in terms of what you're trying to get access to, um, essentially. So I don't think there is a perfect answer, Merrin, but I don't think that means we should write these things off in the same way. There's lots of different ways of getting exposure to interesting investments in public markets. It's the same with private. Um, so can I just offer a slight defence of some of the way that the, the private asset valuations work? So one of the criticisms is that the valuations are not updated often enough because of various reasons. You don't really know the true market value. And people would then say the volatility is dampened because of that. Uh, and that is absolutely true. The volatility is effectively smooth because there's lags in the way these are updated. However, if you look at public markets, public market prices swing around all over the place based on factors which are nothing to do with fundamentals. Like As human beings, we are all prone to fear and greed. Um, and when there is panic in markets, the prices will fall sharply. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean the fundamentals of the business have changed. And often these things have a habit of swinging back the other way once people decide that the world is not going to end. So whilst I think it is fair to say that private asset valuations are smooth and maybe under um, shoot the true um, volatility, I think you can also make an argument that public equity volatility is almost over egged by the behavioural biases that we that we exhibit. So I think that, that both are probably wrong. One is probably too low and one is probably too high. But I think that it's um, the inability to sell private assets easily during kind of stressy markets stops us all from doing the stupid things we might otherwise be tempted to do. Um, so actually that illiquidity almost insulates us from some of our own behavioural biases. So I think that's kind of often a bit um, glossed over um, when people are thinking about about volatility when it comes to private assets. Yeah, so we, it's a it's a great way to protect ourselves from ourselves. Um, Doug, those yeah. are, I know it's like a, 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 bit of, a bit of friction is a good thing in that sense. Actually, um, a bit of friction that stops just just prevents you from the, the knee jerk reaction. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, Doug, there's something else you want to talk about. I know it's a new structure for private assets that our listeners may find interesting. Yeah. So there's um. There's a new structure that's emerging in the UK, which is called the Long Term Asset Fund. Now, the idea here is that to create a structure which allows people some access to liquidity, so um, monthly or quarterly liquidity, i.e. you can get your money in or out fairly regularly, but not daily. Um, and in return for that, you'll get access to a pool of private assets, which will be a combination of things that are invested for the long term, the medium term or the short term to kind of help with that liquidity. And the idea there is that you get much more exposure to a pure NAV rather than having to worry about, um, you know, the discount premium problem we discussed before with investment trusts. Now, that's an emerging structure. Um, and the, um, the FCA have allowed that for DC schemes because they're trying to encourage DC schemes to give people more exposure to this asset class. Um, and they've also recently allowed um, people who are advised by a wealth manager or an advisor to get access to uh, this structure. And there's a few that are starting to emerge. It isn't established yet, but it's something that's coming. Um, I guess the key point here is that, you know, you need to choose the horse for the course. Um, if you are somebody who requires daily liquidity, the investment trust market does a very good job. But you need to do your research and be aware that, um, you know, you can have discounts and premiums. And equally, uh, if you're less worried about 
liquidity and you've got a long term time frame, then the new structure might be something that works really well for you. But the idea here is to try and give people exposure, importantly, to some of these companies, sectors, innovators uh, that sit in the private world in order to enable them to kind of meet their financial objective. And I think that's the thing sometimes we forget is we focus on liquidity and we focus on access and kind of the things that might go wrong. But the reality is what we're trying to do is say, there's an awful lot of interesting investments and innovation that sits in the private world. And we're kind of trying to make sure that um, we can bring people access to that um, in their portfolios. And so that's what the, the new structures are all about. Although there's a slight concern among uh, holders of um, uh, pensions in the UK is that structure may be used to, to force them into investing in the private sector in the UK when they wouldn't necessarily have liked to. There's a type of financial repression built into that structure. Yeah, I think that's how you use the structure, right? And that's kind of pension funds have a fiduciary duty. And I think overall, the government is trying to encourage and kind of um, and give new structures. I think obviously they have a every every pension fund trustee has a duty to their underlying members. And so it needs to be up to them how they think about this area. But I, I think our point of view would be, let's make some structures available and then decide if you want to get access to private assets and use them rather than you have to uh, be forced into something like this. Okay. Um, a couple more questions for, for both of you. The first is, I know I said earlier that we couldn't fix the public markets in this podcast, but if there was one thing that either of you could do that might make public markets begin to be more attractive again, what, what would it be? Is there a legislative change, a shift in regulation? What could there be that might bring people back to the listed market? I mean, our own view, by the way, John and I have been talking about this, and we have a slight sense that the shift in the interest rate environment might bring people back automatically. The, the thing that I think we would need, or I would, I would really love to see in this country, and, I'm, and I'm not sure how we engineer it, is that we have a culture, I think, where our attitude to risk is that it should be minimised. So a lot of the way that people think about investing is trying to think about ways to remove all of the risks, um, which for us actually, I feel like if we can have a culture which is much more about embracing risk, and I think with that it probably comes with a better understanding from an earlier age, um, so some of the demystifying investing for people when they're still at school age rather than waiting until they're in their 40s and they decide to talk to a financial advisor. Duncan, the only thing I would say about that is that you know, you're very young, right? And so, you know, we're an aging society and the older people get, the more frightened they are of risk perfectly reasonably. You know, if in your, in your 50s or 60s, what do you want? You want a risk of capital loss or you want a 6% dividend yield? I know what I'm going to want in, in my 60s and it's certainly not going to be embracing risk in small, growing, unlisted companies. I'm going to want my dividend yield and I'm going to want to protect my capital as best as possible. So in an aging society, there's always a bias against risk and there is no getting away from that. Although interesting, Mary, maybe none for another podcast. We know that people, when they retire, consistently underestimate how long they'll need their income for and probably don't take enough risk to keep their capital pool strong. But that's, that's probably one for another day. It is one um, for another day. They also don't take <laughs> enough out of their pot. They, you know, they don't understand the importance of dying broke. Yeah. Everyone exactly. should die broke. Then, of course, you wouldn't have to worry about inheritance tax either. Now, listen, before, before we finish up, you two. Um, uh, Duncan, one of the things that you do at Schroeder's that I absolutely love is that valuation table you, you provide for us every every month. And when we look at that, again, of course, the UK is consistently looking cheap, cheap, cheap. But what, what other markets look cheap on your valuation metrics at the moment? It's fun. Um, uh, emerging markets as well. Emerging markets have had a particularly bad period for quite an extended period now compared with developed markets and valuations are, are quite appealing there. I think Japan is a really interesting one though. Um, and you know, you've spoken about this before, the fact that a large proportion of Japanese companies are valued at less than the, the book value, particularly the accounting value of, of their businesses. And the regulator this year has said um, basically something about it. It's kind of an explain if you're an institution, tell us what you're going to do about it. Uh, and that's why we're looking to see more changes in um, share buybacks, other more share held friendly activities. So I think that Japan is, people again have been saying cheap for a while, but it does feel like this year it's actually having a bit of a resurgence. Excellent. And uh, final question, this is for both of you. Doug, you ready? Okay. Okay, I'm going to lock you in a room for 10 years. Well, not really, metaphorically. Um, and before you go, you can only invest in one thing, gold, Bitcoin, not strictly an investment, but you know what I mean. Gold, Bitcoin, or you can stick your money in a UK deposit account. What's it going to be? 
Gold. Good answer. We've had a couple of Bitcoins recently. We're getting very confused. Duncan? Yeah, gold too. Gold. Okay, that's kind of hoping one of you would be Bitcoin, but both gold is absolutely fine with us. We've been, <laughs> we've been disinformated by the Bitcoiners recently. It's made John and I have to think about how we can tell people to invest in Bitcoin, which is, which is awkward. Anyway, thank you both so much for joining us. That was absolutely fascinating. And listeners, there you go. Japan is cheap, the UK is cheap, and, you know, gold. Thanks for listening to this week's Marin Talks Money. Catch our debrief on this week's conversation on the Marin Talks Money after show under our normal feed. Now, that is only accessible to Apple News subscribers. But if you're a Bloomberg subscriber, look for the after show online. In the meantime, if you like our show, rate, review and subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. This episode was hosted by me, Marin Somerset Webb. It was produced by Summer Saadi. Additional editing by Blake Maples. Special thanks to Duncan Lamont, Doug Abbott, and of course, as ever, to John Stefek. Be sure to sign up to John's daily newsletter, Money Distilled, where you can hear something from him every day, and it's always good. Link in the show notes. 